Do you know the tale of the forging of Lightbringer? I shall tell it to you. It was a time when darkness lay heavy on the world. To oppose it, the hero must have a hero's blade, oh, like none that had ever been. And so for thirty days and thirty nights, Azora High labored sleepless in the temple, forging a blade in the sacred fires, heat and hammer and fold, heat and hammer and fold. Oh yes, until the sword was done. Yet when he plunged it into water to temper the steel, it burst asunder. Being a hero, it was not for him to shrug and go in search of excellent grapes such as these. So again he began. The second time, it took him fifty days and fifty nights, and this sword seemed ever finer than the first. Azora High captured a lion to temper the blade by plunging it through the beast's red heart. But once more the steel shattered and split. Great was his woe, and great was his sorrow then, for he knew what he must do. Hey everyone, Crowfood's daughter here, and if you click this video, you have reached the Disputed Lands. I know I had promised a video on the Dothraki Sea, and believe me, it is coming, but I may be collaborating on some things pertaining to Hazor Mai, and need to put that on hold for the time being. So, in the meantime, I will be going over some things that I've written about in the past, and mentioned in my live stream. So, in the previous video, we discussed the Nissa Nissa monomyth, through an examination of the Grey King's mermaid wife. And in doing so, we laid out the common denominator that ties drowned characters such as Patchface to the concept of the drowned god. So now, in today's video, we are going to take a look at another portion of the Zora High monomyth, the Broken Sword. And in doing so, we will be identifying other examples of Azora High and the symbolism surrounding this legend. This video is the fourth in a series discussing Ironborn myth and legend, and is best viewed if you understand the concepts covered in the previous videos, which I've linked in the comment section below. Now let's get started. So Broken Swords. The concept of the Broken Sword is a theme of many myths, legends, and stories generally signifying defeat and the loss of honor, with the reforging resulting in victory and the restoration of honor. Examples of this can be found in many places, such as Nordic myth, Arthurian legend, and even the writings of Tolkien. Now, in addition to Nissa Nissa, a broken sword is also part of the Azor High monomyth. If you look at the tale, it is said his sword broke twice before he tempered his blade into the heart of Nissa Nissa. And in the story of the last hero, we also find a broken sword. Yet here and there, in the fastness of the woods, the children still lived in their wooden cities and hollow hills, and the faces in the trees kept watch. So as cold and death filled the earth, the last hero determined to seek out the children in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what the armies of men had lost. He set out into the Deadlands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one, his friends died and his horse, and finally, even his dog and his sword froze so hard, the blade snapped when he tried to use it. So there we have another broken sword. Additionally, you might have also noticed that right from the get-go in the prologue of A Game of Thrones, we are also provided with a symbolic representation of this last hero character, as we are given a Night's Watch brother whose sword breaks as he is fighting the others. Even Beric Dondarrion, who gives us our strong, resurrected Azor Ahai archetype, also gives us our broken sword symbol when he's fighting as a champion of the Lord of Light. Smooth as summer silk, Lord Beric slid close to make an end of the man before him. The hound gave a rasping scream, 
raised his sword in both hands and brought it crashing down with all his strength. Lord Beric blocked the cut easily. No! Arya shrieked. But the burning sword snapped in two, and the hound's cold steel plowed into Lord Beric's flesh, where his shoulder joined his neck and clove him clean down to the breastbone. The blood came rushing out in a hot black gush. So it is safe to say that a broken sword is a strong symbol of our long night hero. Now what you might not realize is that our author uses imagery of other broken items and weapons as an allusion to broken swords. As we have learned in the previous Ironborn videos, there is heavy drowning and resurrection symbolism tied to the Grey King and Azor Ahai monomyth. What you might not have noticed is that Tyrion had acquired and was using a broken spear at the end of the fiery Battle of the Blackwater, right before he was cut down by a Kingsguard who was described as a white shadow and then subsequently fell in the river. He lost his knife and gained a broken spear. He could not have said how. He clutched it and stabbed, shrieking curses. Men ran from him, and he ran after them, clambering up over the rail to the next ship, and then the next. His two white shadows were always with him, Balon Swan and Mandon Moore, beautiful in their pale plate. So yes, this, of course, is excellent symbolism for Azor Ahai, as the others are also described as white shadows, and we have our character wielding a broken weapon and then falling into the river when Mandon Moore cuts him down. Now, a broken sword is also found wielded by another legendary hero, the Titan of Bravos. His legs bestrode the gap, one foot planted on each mountain his shoulders looming tall above the jagged crests. His legs were carved of solid stone, the same black granite as the sea moths on which he stood, though around his hips he wore an armored skirt of greenish bronze. His breastplate was bronze as well, and his head and his crested halpelm. His blowing hair was made of hempen ropes dyed green, and huge fires burned in the caves that were his eyes. One hand rested atop the ridge to his left, bronze fingers coiled around a knob of stone, the other thrust up into the air, clasping the hilt of a broken sword. So the Titan of Bravos is really one of those legends we know very little about, only that he is supposed to come to life and wade out into the sea to defend the seafaring city of Bravos. And Old Nan has told Arya's stories of the Titan feasting on the juicy pink flesh of highborn girls. Additionally, we are uncertain of the age of the city of Bravos, only that it was founded during the time of the Valyrian Freehold. So essentially, it could be relatively young, as it is said to be the youngest of the free cities. So this legend is particularly difficult to hash out. The legend of the Titan could be borrowed from any one of the many cultures that escaped to the region, or the Titan could be unique to Bravos itself, which means it is very difficult to ascertain if we are being given another version of the Azor Ahai monomyth, or if we are simply being given a representation that is purely symbolic and meant to inform the reader in another way. Now, with that being said, the Titan is a green-clad warrior with fiery eyes depicted with green hair who emerges from the sea and wields a broken sword as he roars to herald the rising and the setting of the sun. Now, if you watch my video on Garth and the Grey King, you will know that the Grey King at one point underwent a Grey transformation. But before this transformation, he was most likely like his brother, a Garth-type figure, which is something that is hinted at with the sigil of the extinct House Greyiron, which depicts the head of the Sea King with green hair and a green beard. Now, being that we know nothing of the supposed Sea King and have only learned of the Grey King, a character who is said to rule the sea itself, 
Well, what we are probably being given with this sigil is a mugshot of the Grey King prior to this transformation. So, after learning in our last video about the legend of the Shrouded Lord, who was a statue who comes to life, and understanding there are some hints of the Grey King being Garth-like with green hair, well, with the Titan of Bravos, we get a statue which legend says comes to life and wades into the sea with a broken sword and green hair with fire in his eyes. In addition to this, Peter Baelish's grandfather also bore the Titan's head for a sigil, which Sansa notices when they stay in his keep in the fingers. This sigil is displayed on a shield, and next to that shield, we see another broken sword. Above the hearth hung a broken longsword and a battered oaken shield, its paint cracked and flanking. The device painted on the shield was one Sansa did not know, a gray stone head with fiery eyes upon a light green field. My grandfather's shield, Peter explained, when he saw her gazing at it. So again, we get a broken sword and the Titan of Bravos. Now, the Titan is a fortress. It's in the likeness of a statue, and it's considered one of the nine wonders made by man, according to Lomas Longstrider. Knowing this, it's easy to see some of the inspiration for the Titan lay in the Colossus of Rhodes, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This bronze-covered colossus was erected as a tribute to the sun god Helios. However, in addition to the Colossus, there may be some other things going on with what inspired our author. You see, in addition to this famous seventh wonder, there is also the myth of Talos, a name which means sun in the ancient Greek dialect. Talos is also a bronze statue, which comes to life detailed in the Argonautica. In fact, Talos also makes an appearance in the 1960s cult classic film Jason and the Argonauts, whose filmmakers used the Colossus of Rhodes as their model and aesthetic as he stands astride a channel. So now, knowing this, let's take a look at another Roaring Titan. And this is one that we had already identified as part of the Grey King monomyth in my last video, the Grey Giant Argoth Stoneskin. This giant is said to have spent his days raging outside Old Town roaring for his bride. And just like there are tales of the shrouded Lord starting out as a statue and coming to life, and the tale of the statue of the Titan coming to life, we are also given an allusion to this theme with a moniker such as Stone Skin. And when we examine the inspiration for the Titan of Bravos, such as the tale of Talos detailed in the Argonautica who fought Jason and the Argonauts, we quickly come to understand where the inspiration for the name Argoth is derived. But the Titan of Bravos is not the only green-haired legend that could possibly lay within this monomyth. I have seen some in the forums conclude the sigil of House Grey Iron is a depiction of the Morlin King. This is somewhat influenced by an eerily similar sigil of House Manderly, which depicts a merman with similar green hair and beard. And truly, they're not far wrong. If you toy with the possibility the Merlin King is also part of this monomyth, other things begin to line up. As with the broken spear discussed with Tyrion in the Battle of the Blackwater, our author can get a little sly with his broken sword symbolism. The Merlin King is a great example of this. It is not hard to see the connections within the Grey King legend. We're already aware the Grey King is said to have taken a mermaid to wife. Aaron mentions there are mermaids in the Drowned God's watery halls. And Asha mentions Merlings are the subjects of the Drowned God when she said, Below the waves, the Merlings hail their lord by blowing into seashells. So, the Merlin King, in a sense, is just a spin placed on the Grey King myth itself. Now, if you recall, after Davos was drowned in the Battle of the Blackwater, 
he miraculously survived, and the place where he washed ashore was called the Spears of the Merlin King. And when Sansa is spirited away, giving us our abducted woman symbol, the ship she is taken aboard was also called the Merlin King. And when we first hear about this ship, it is Peter discussing his marriage plans with his small council, and we are given this very fitting drowning reference. How soon might you leave? On the morrow, if the winds permit, there's a Bravosi galley out past the chain, taking on cargo by boat. The Merlin King, I'll see your captain about a berth. You will miss the king's wedding, said Mace Tyrell. Peter Baelish gave a shrug. Tides and brides wait on no man, my lord. Once the autumn storms begin, the voyage will be much more hazardous. Drowning would definitely diminish my charms as a bridegroom. Later, in a dance with dragons, Davos is taken to Merman Court, where he meets Sir Marlon Manderley. Let's take a look. The knight wore silver armor, his greaves and gauntlet inlaid with Nielo to suggest flowing fronds of seaweed. The helm beneath his arm was the head of the Merlin King, with a crown of mother of pearl and a jutting beard of jet and jade. His own beer was as gray as a winter sea. Davos rose. May I know your name, sir? Sir Marlon Manderley. He was a head taller than Davos and three stones heavier, with slate gray eyes and a haughty way of speaking. As we can see, Marlon Manderley is basically wearing a great big Merlin King symbol. We can also see by the bearded helm that the Merlin King is indeed depicted with green hair. However, it is what is underneath that armor that gave me pause. Underneath, we have a gray man with gray eyes and a beard as gray as a winter sea. Notice the uncannily similar wordplay we have here with the description of the Gray King. The Gray King ruled the sea itself and took a mermaid to wife, so that his sons and daughters might live above the waves or beneath them as they chose. His hair and beard and eyes were as gray as a winter sea, and from these he took his name. So underneath that Merlin King cosplay, we are being given a great big gray king symbol. But before Davos goes to Merman's court, Davos is in White Harbor and we are being given yet another statue, a statue of a merman within the courtyard. And what do you know? In addition to a storm reference, we are also being provided with our broken sword symbol. He was here for the night. He gazed up at old Fishfoot with his broken trident. I have come through rain and rack and storm. I will not go back without doing what I came for no matter how hopeless it may seem. He might have lost his fingers and his luck, but he was no ape in velvet. He was a king's hand. Well, there you have it. We are being given a statue of a merman holding a broken trident. And in that same chapter, Davos describes the statue as having hair green with lichen. So just as we have a statue of a titan with green hair holding a broken sword, we are being given a statue of a merman with green hair holding a broken trident. Additionally, what you might find interesting is that in the world book, it is also said that the Merlin King gifted House Valerian with a driftwood throne to conclude a pact. And we also know that the Grey King's throne that is supposedly made from the jaws of Naga is now lost to history. And from what we've learned so far, this special throne was most likely not made from the bones of a sea dragon, but rather wood, sometimes described as werewood, other times driftwood. This means that the throne the Merlin King gave to conclude a pact was most likely none other than his own. So now, the main point of this video was to bring home the idea of the monomyth 
of not just Azora High, and not just Nissa Nissa, but also the concept of the broken sword as an additional part of this monomyth and what our author might be trying to show us when we see them within the storyline. So now, with that being said, I do have just one more thing. Remember in my last video, we talked about the trademark run-of-the-mill mermaid myth is luring sailors to their deaths with their song or beauty. Well, what I want you to do now is question why we have a character who at one point had the head of the Titan of Bravos for a sigil and rode on a ship called the Merlin King when he spirited Sansa away and why this same character is also given a broken sword above his hearth. What I want you to do is think about how this symbolism can inform you about the character of Peter Baelish and how this information can inform you about the character of Azor Ahai. And lastly, I want you to know there is another myth out there, a myth very much like that of mermaids. It is a tale of a cunning man who wanted to be ruler of them all and lured warriors to their death with his gift of voice. This man became the first mockingbird. Well, that about wraps things up for today. Links to my original essay from last year, my live stream, and the myth of the first mockingbird are provided in the comment section below. Now, like I had mentioned previously, I may be collaborating on some concepts with Who's Or Am I? And so I'm putting my Dothraki C video on hold for the moment. So my next video will be on the true meaning of the power of King's blood. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. Thanks for watching!